I have got uh, with me uh, Sasha Meinrath, who is uh, um, the director of the Open Technology Initiative here at New America, um, and Ian Schuler, who is at the State Department, Senior Program Manager, um, Internet Freedom Programs. Um, now, the context for this discussion was set by a, a New York Times article um, on, the, I think, the front page of this, the Sunday paper a few weeks ago. I remember it well. It was called, it, it, the headline was, U.S. underwrites internet detour around censors. Had a very arresting lead paragraph. Um, the Obama administration is leading a global effort to deploy, quote, shadow internet and mobile phone systems that dissidents can use to undermine repressive governments that seek to silence them <coughs> by censoring or shutting down telecommunications networks. But what really got my attention was the second paragraph when it, when it described, quote, one operation out of a spy novel in a fifth floor shop on L Street in Washington <laughs> where a group of young entrepreneurs who look as if they could be in a garage band are fitting deceptively innocent looking hardware into a prototype internet in a suitcase. Now when I read that I really did, I think, sounds like a cool place. You know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, it really sounds like an exotic, cool place full of cool people. I read further and found that they were talking about the New America Foundation. <laughs> um, and, and I thought, you know, that's funny. I've been a fellow here for like six years, and I never see any cool people <laughs> at the New America Foundation. I mean, whenever I'm there, it's just people like, you know, Sasha Meinrath. And, you know, um, so I was kind of surprised to read on and, and find out that he was the, uh, the ringleader. The, the description of him, though, does make it clear how he had managed to conceal the fact that he's consorting with cool people, it describes this group. <laughs> one of them sporting multiple ear piercings and a studded leather wristband. Uh, one of them an accomplished ha hacker and so on. And it says, then there was Mr. Meinrath wearing a tie as the dean of the group at age 37. <laughs> so you're the public face of these subversives and that's why you're here today. Um, so I wanna, uh, this is a very interesting issue as uh, I think people have gathered by now. A lot of implications for policy um, government policy and even kind of for think tank policy in a way. I mean, it's kind of an unusual thing for a think tank um, to do. Uh, but before we uh, get into that and before we, I hope, have time to take a couple of questions from the audience, Sasha, you want to just elaborate a little on how this thing works that, that, that helps people uh, get around any, any government intervention? Uh, sure. Uh, let me first start by cautioning you about starting memes. <laughs> and What's interesting is the actual, the true history of the internet in a suitcase was that when Jim Glantz, who did a really great job on this article, contacted us and said, so what is it that you're doing? And we explained, well, we're doing all this programming, we're developing this software, it can run on a whole bunch of different devices and turn them into blah, 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 and then it just ended up not really capturing anyone's attention. He's like, so what is the thing that comes out of it? And we're like, well, it's sort of a distributed infrastructure, it can run on any <laughs> device. And he's like, so, we have a photographer coming tomorrow. What is he going to photograph? And we're like, that's a good question. And so literally we went out and bought a suitcase and took <laughs> a bunch of equipment that we had around the office that is sort of the examples of what this technology can run on and put it into a suitcase. And the rest is history. So yeah. I view the internet in a suitcase as it's actually a visual aid gone out of control. <laughs> But the, the idea behind what we're developing, which is actually the important component here, is that you can use the technologies, the hardware that are on the ground today in these locations. You don't actually need to para-drop in a giant internet in a suitcase. You can transform people's available cell phones, laptops and computers, wireless routers that you might pick up here in the States at Best Buy or what have you into your telecommunications infrastructure. And if you use software like the type that we're creating, you don't need a central cell tower, you don't even need an internet uplink to communicate locally. And you can imagine, if you can set up a system whereby there is no center, there's no point of surveillance, there's no point of control, there's no point to shut down. There's just a bunch of different equipment that people are turning on, turning off, that's creating this network of connectivity for sharing information, for distributing the phone pictures before your phone actually gets confiscated. 
that that becomes a very powerful tool. Now, if you have an uplink of any sort, a satellite phone, a dial-up modem, et cetera, this will spread that connectivity throughout that network. But if you don't have an internet uplink, you still maintain local connectivity. And so you can think about this as, what's the first thing anyone that has an office with a bunch of computers do? They network all of those computers together and start sharing files, printers, other services and applications. What we're doing is saying, how do we take that same powerful tool and put it into the hands of anyone that wants to set up a network? So the technology is actually, the components of it exist today. And what we're really focusing on is, how do we make them user friendly and how do we integrate these best of technologies from projects all around the globe into a single package that can be transported, not in a gigantic suitcase, but on your cell phone, on a USB drive, on a CD-ROM, on your laptop, or any other storage medium on Earth. OK. Now, does every device, I, I mean, so, so, so it's like a diffuse network it can involve cell phones, computers, whatever. Does every device have to have something implanted in it or, or some software no, put so in it? Or? Yeah, so you can have hybrid networks where mm -hmm. some devices have the software on that. Uh -huh. But part of what we're doing is things like, so we have a little device upstairs. It's about the size of a small lunch box. Mm -hmm. And it operates as a cell tower. And it runs on a couple of watts of electricity. So now all of a sudden, you can throw that into your backpack, walk into an area, and have basically a mini zone of connectivity for already existing cell phones to make local calls even if the cell towers in that area have been shut down. So that requires nothing on these other cell phones that exist. OK. But you would have to diffuse some technology pretty broadly across a country to render the whole country impervious to authoritarian constraint. Is that right? Yeah, I don't think this is a universal workaround. I would have, yeah. In fact, I would caution strongly. Like, this doesn't okay. solve all your problems. It's not a silver bullet. It doesn't guarantee anonymity or security for communications. It helps along those lines. But I, you know, we want to be extremely cautious about saying, like, this thing solves all your problems. It's just a very useful, not just a single tool, but kind of a tool chest of different okay. technologies that can help make your communications secure, can help make your communications anonymous, and can help ensure information dissemination. OK. Um, now you. Gave him the money for this, is that right? <laughs> yes, yes, not me personally, oh. uh, but uh, the State Department is funding the, the project that, that Sasha is talking about as part of our Internet Freedom Programs. And there's a rationale behind this, I take it. Yeah, and, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of happy to be here to, uh, and on this panel with Sasha to talk about the, the program, because I do think there is a lot of confusion about the Internet in a Suitcase project, as, as Sasha said. If, if you're talking to somebody and they think there's actually a suitcase, they probably don't know what they're talking about. and so. You know, for us, it was very important. A few of the, the, some of the things that we were, the, the ration, these rationale, the things that were important to us when we were considering this was that it would run on equipment that was already there. It didn't require bringing uh, technology in. Uh, that uh, it could run on the, 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 the cell phones that people were using, the laptops they were using, the routers they were already using. And that it was a, um, it was a another criteria that was important for us is that it was basically open source technology, that they were taking things that were already there uh, and developing them, making them work together in a way that one could easily roll out something that is already a proven technology. And so the, when in the article uh, where it goes into the sort of cloak and dagger uh, aspect of it and you know, the, these sort of mysterious pieces of technology, well, it's, it, everything that's a, that, that it will be developed is, is an open source project that anyone in the room could freely download. So I think that you know, the, for us, it, it, this wasn't about uh, some sort of secret tool that we could drop in, parachute in somewhere, but really making available tools that would allow activists and, and individuals in internet restrained environments to creatively combine them in different ways or find an appropriate mix that helps them get past the challenges that they're facing in the, in the, in the country that they happen to be in. And that's not a matter of us going in and deciding what that is, but putting out the tools that they can use to more effectively do this on their own. OK. So I gather one use might have been when, when Mubarak shut down the internet. Um, sure. Would this have been a, a really significant um, tool? You, you could have, you could have over, 
overcome that? Uh, this certainly would help address mm -hmm. that problem. I, you know, I'm, again, I don't want to oversell what, what this thing is. It, it would depend on how widely it was spread, how many people were That's plugged right. in, and so on. But this type of technology, yeah, um, I mean, if it were in place already. Yeah, the largest networks today using this technology right now, or mm -hmm. different components of this technology, have coverage areas of metro scale and larger. I think the largest is around 3,000 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it would dwarf most metropolitan city areas. And this is what's currently fully operational right now. Okay. And, and so you could imagine setting something like this up in, in a Tahrir Square. Because it wasn't just the internet that was shut down. Mobile phones were shut down at, at various times as well. And uh, yeah, allowing people in a, in a tight area to be able to communicate with each other. And that's, a, that's sort of an issue where I, I want to add to some, things, some of the, the themes that came up in the previous panel. I mean, I agree that broadcast technology is a very important part of informing uh, people in, in information restrained environments about what else is out there and, and helping people to ask questions. And I think yeah, I agree that, uh, that the, the BBG and the BOA and all those efforts need to be supported. But I do think that that's only one piece of the puzzle. And what we, if, if the past year has taught us anything, it's that what can be truly transformational is the ability of people to connect with each other and share stories with each other and to have their voices heard and get information out. And so uh, when we think about internet freedom, we're not just thinking about getting somebody else's information in, but really empowering people to be able to express themselves, to associate with each other. And these are the sorts of tools that allow that uh, in a very powerful way, whether or not there is a, a connection to the global internet or however good that connection to the global internet might be. Okay, so I gather the, the kind of official State Department rationale. This is not a matter of national security strategy in a sense. It's, it's a human rights exactly. rationale. Yes. Okay, but um, I assume it has not escaped the attention of people in the government who do national security. Um, and I would, I would think one question they would ask is, okay, so your, your philosophy is just get it out there, right? And let the chips fall where they may. I can imagine groups you would actually wouldn't especially want to have this. I mean, to take a concrete example, in Yemen right now, there are a number of groups who, uh, who are at odds with an authoritarian government. I don't think I'd be enthusiastic about all of them having this. Um, right? Good. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, and, uh, I mean, the, the, the really bad guys probably have better things than, than we're developing anyway in some cases. And, and, and I don't know. Osama bin Laden was using like, like VHS, right? Right. And when, when it turns out. Uh, and, and, so. and have creative ways of, they, they have found creative ways of, of solving these sorts of problems. I mean, I think you, in thinking about it in the same terms as we think of speech, I mean, we, we allow speech, we allow openness. Uh, and, and we deal with people who decide to abuse those. And, and, and so I think that, that, our, that the, the approach that we're taking is, is a similar one where, you know, on the one hand, I mean, I think the approach is similar that we are building tools and tools can be used by bad guys. Uh, we, that shouldn't discourage us from building tools. We still need to have tools, but we are trying to be smart about how we, how we build these and building tools that are designed for openness, that are designed for participation, that are designed for large scales of people to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, building in the, the, the use cases that are built around people who are uh, engaged in peaceful protests for rights make it so that those tools are more suited for people who are, who are using them in, a, in, in ways that we envision. Uh, certainly, the, in, the uh, intelligent community knows about things that we're doing, uh, and when we when we talk to them about it, they think they're, they they see it in the conversations that I've had. Very few of the questions have been, "What happens when this falls in the hands of a bad guy?" It's more understanding what the the, the potential, how this can be used by people who are uh, who are in, in, in the country, uh, activists, and the other people that we're working with. Um, and and I, yeah, I think that. It, it is important for us to, to keep that in mind and, and to consider that, and, just, and, and we do, but, but it's also important for the, the use of tools by bad people not to keep us from building them, that, if, you know, that we shouldn't not build uh, uh, hammers that are, are, are better, that firefighters can use to break through windows because we're afraid of people using them to steal cars. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on the good guy, bad guy thing? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, in a civil society, the fundamental human right to communicate needs mm -hmm. to be ascendant and the priority. And like any powerful tool, as Ian mentions, like peop some people will use that for malfeasant purposes. But the overall massive, useful, beneficial impact 
so outweighs that tiny fraction of a percent use case that I think it's a very clear, it's an obvious win for civil society. Okay. The, um, I guess the other question that nationals, I don't want to spend the whole time on, on, Nash, on, on grand strategy. I guess the other question national security people would ask is in comparing different countries, um, there, are, there seems to be um, a less than universal approach in, in term, when, when we think about which dictators we want to fall. I know, I know in, the, um, uh, in this New York Times piece, it said the State Department is financing the creation of stealth wireless networks they would enable activists to communicate outside the reach of governments in countries like Iran, Syria, and Libya. Um, and I noticed they didn't mention Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, and, um, you know, I, I uh, for better or worse, I guess our policy is, um, uh, uh, is in that sense, I mean, g given that we, we currently are, are, are not trying to push topple leaders in Saudi Arabia and, and Bahrain is, is kind of inconsistent with an undiscerning promulgation of this technology, right? And I guess well, and, and the, the the majority of our programs, I mean, our, our programs really are underpinned by that that human rights approach, which we feel is global. Uh, and we are doing work in places, in, in plenty of places that are allies of the United States, in order to advance uh, people's access to rights and ability to use these sorts of tools. And the tools that are being developed are being developed and, and put out there for whomever it is that decides that they want to take advantage of this, whether they live in Saudi Arabia or whether they live in, in, mm -hmm. in, in Iran. Uh, I, the, the, I, I, again, I, I, mean, I, I, I think that the, the article certainly does give it more of a, a picks countries picks particular mm -hmm. countries and, and, and gives it more of a, a regime change bend that is certain than is certainly the intent of the programming itself. We're very uh, careful and clear to make sure that to, um, to, to ground this in the, uh, the desire to globally expand uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom mm -hmm. of assembly without picking winners and without, uh, without choosing how people will use those tools and what they'll say on them. Mm -hmm. It's um, funny, I don't know how many people remember the clipper chip from the Clinton administration. Uh, just almost the opposite, right? The opposite. The idea was that they wanted to, to make it legally mandatory to put a chip into every computer that would make it impossible for that computer to be used to circumvent centralized authority, or at least the, the one centralized authority, the U.S. government. Um, this, is, this is a complete kind of uh, 180, right? It is. And it, it's... Not just that, but we like then learned from these kinds of, you know, solutions. And so one of the reasons to ensure, to guarantee that all the code is open source, is to ensure that there's absolutely no backdoor mm -hmm. in this kind of soft for any. I mean, it's not just U.S. governments; any government. We just want to ensure that, you know, the smartest developers in the open source community have the ability to look at everything and verify that mm -hmm. this is completely free of that kind of central command and control mechanism because that defeats the fundamental purpose of the technology, which is to ensure no matter what the communications exist. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you both a question. Um, is it your view that even if you weren't doing this, if you just let market forces uh, push the evolution of technology as they have been for the last few decades, mm -hmm. that, that the drift of this evolution is in favor of freedom in the sense that, that uh, you know, the internet and various digital technologies have made it harder to suppress free speech, have tended on balance to decentralize power so that, uh, you know, even in places like, chi like China, uh, the government has a harder time controlling speech than they did 30 years ago, say, and that kind of whatever happens uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Arab Spring, it seems safe to say uh, that, that people, uh, that the government will, will be uh, less able to uh, suppress speech and, and more, more responsive, probably on balance, to popular will than, you know, 30 years ago. Is that, is that a property of the general drift of things, in your view? Uh, no, I mean, I, th I do think that, you know, if you look back at the history of the Internet, you know, when, when on the eighth day uh, Al Gore and his friends invented the Internet, they baked into it certain properties uh, of openness and equality of packets and those sorts of things that, that made it uh, imbued some of the, with, with not necessarily intentionally, imbued some of those sorts of thing, uh, rights into it that we began to enjoy. And, and we've, what, we've, what we've seen since is the ability of people who aren't necessarily happy with that arrangement to very effectively 
uh, curtail or bend the rules of the internet to make it work in ways that are more favorable to them. And so, uh, you know, I, I do think, uh, while we do have uh, some of the things that we have on our side of the balance sheet as far as keeping the internet open is uh, certainly that, 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 that expectation of how it used to be, but also the, you know, a lot of creativity of individuals who want to, want to tell their stories and want to have their voices heard and want to be able to get access to information. And that is sort of being pitted against this group of people who have also have a lot of resources and a lot of control over infrastructure who have a different view of how it should work. And our programs are really, you know, in that venture capital approach that, that the Assistant Secretary Posner spoke about earlier, are trying to use the, the, the modest resources that we have available to, uh, on this front to empower those, those activists, those individuals, the, the, the people who are doing open source projects, the, the people who are using these tools to ha have their voices heard, try to make it easier for them to push the boundaries, mm -hmm. to push the, the, the future of the internet more towards the free than towards the closed. Okay, so you, you, you think freedom really needs kind of a, a helping hand. It, it, it's, it's not just gonna happen naturally, necessarily. Yeah, and constant vigilance. I mean, you look at the last 150 years of telecommunications from telegraph on forward and what you have is an explosive growth and use of these new technologies, the home rule telephony movement, mm -hmm. which AT&T and the Bell Systems systematically undermined from 1913 mm -hmm. forward. The growth in the 20s of the amateur radio movement that then got reorchestrated with the development of the Federal Communications Commission and then eliminated from the hands of community members and put into the hands of fewer and fewer folks. Mm -hmm the rise of local access television stations and now the demise of many of them, the rise of independent internet service providers and now the elimination of over three quarters of them in the United States. So I feel like if the last 150 years of telecommunications history is something that we should look back on to figure out what's gonna happen with today's ascendant telecommunications technology, without that constant vigilance, we will just repeat that same cycle hmm. of openness and innovation, and then slow enclosure and control. Okay, so this is kind of the thesis of the book, The Master Switch. The, I mean, you, you, bu you buy that argument. Mm. I buy some of Tim's arguments. Okay. Um, we should plug it anyway, because he was, he was, a, <laughs> he was a fellow yes. here, after all, before he, uh, he went into the government. Um, uh, Okay, so you, 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 you have a sense that it's really a struggle and, you, and you're kind of doing God's work. Um, <laughs> hey, no, that's, that's good. I, I think probably we all do, actually, in different <laughs> ways. Um, so you don't worry that there's any such thing as kind of too fast. I mean, when you look at a place like China or, um, or even the Arab world, I mean, when you look at the way the politics has been and the way society has been and something like this hits, you're talking about really, really rapid change. And, you know, Tom Friedman has argued that in Tunisia and Egypt, we've seen kind of the easy cases. And when you, when you get to a place like uh, Syria, you know, sectarian divisions, various other play, uh, things um, uh, complicate uh, transition. Um, and I've heard people I respect argue that for the time being, uh, for the government to prevail in Syria is going to save a lot of lives. They're, 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 these, these are not crazy people saying you could be talking hundreds of thousands um, of lives. Do you think there's any chance that this kind of technology would be deployed in a situation like that uh, and things would happen so fast that given the context, you know, horrible things, at least in the short run, would happen because of this? You're asking, is there any chance that is bad a, things would happen? Yes. There is a chance that bad things, okay. <laughs> well, we, can I quote you on that in the future? Um, uh, well, is there a significant chance that this bad thing, and, and, you know, would you feel bad? I mean, would you feel, you know, you're doing this. I, I, if you're promulgating the technology led to something like that, uh, would you rethink uh, the whole thing? I mean, I think, it, it, like, at the end of the day, again, these, we have to remember that these are tools, and people are, you know, giving people an ability to have their voice heard or giving them an ability to talk to each other more effectively isn't something that we should regret, and neither should we be de determining, you know, in, in this room or elsewhere, that who should have what levels of freedom at what time and how that should be metered out to, to different folks. But we, we I think that, that the, the approach in a very messy world where things get messy, the, the approach that we've been taking of uh, trying to uh, 
facilitate expression, facilitate association, facilitate basic rights will at the end of the day be the best, the best approach that we can take in a messy world. Okay. And I gather that this is one of a number of technologies that the State Department is subsidizing that broadly yeah. speaking have the same effect. Well, again, the, uh, so the State Department by the end of the year, I think as Assistant Secretary Posner mentioned, by the end of this year will have, uh, have invested over $70 million uh, over the past now uh, three years in internet freedom programs. This is one of uh, dozen, uh, a dozen or more projects that we inv are investing, have invested in over that time. Uh, different projects are, are geared at different things, and some of them are technologies like this, and uh, dealing with new problems like the shutdown of the master switch. Some of them, when, we, when this initiative began to, uh, to, to start it out, were more focused on uh, simpler problems like just the firewall, or, more, or, or other or security problems like what if someone steals my cell phone. And so we're looking at a range of different threats to, to internet freedom and, and so, sorts of repression and trying to, to balance them out with technologies, but also with uh, education, policy work, other ways that uh, the, a basket of different approaches that we think will, uh, will lead to more free op and open internet and, and, and ability of, of individuals to, exp to, to, to mm -hmm. utilize that in a, in a free way. Okay. And do you think it's not too cynical to suspect that although the State Department is in favor of, of across the board promulgation, there's someone somewhere in another part of the government that sometimes slips this stuff to some people and chooses not to slip it to other people? Well, I, I mean, I think that, that what we're trying to do with all of this, uh, these tools is to try to make them as readily available as possible. So the, the other people, uh, the, I, I, we, the, I don't know, I mean, the, <laughs> that this wasn't the question I thought you were going to ask. I question. thought you were going to ask a different, I'm, I'm go a really different round of this. this <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we were, the, the government, the U.S. government is balancing a lot of interests. Uh, again, as Secretary Posner, Assistant Secretary Posner said today, there, is, there are intellectual property interests in, around an open internet. There are security interests. There are uh, rights interests and what we do is continue to within government uh, bring that rights approach and make sure that that's being considered and uh, and that our policies reflect that I think you could run for office that was very well handled <laughs> that was uh, um, uh, I'm the geek I'm not supposed well, to be I was, the I was policy gonna, I was gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna recommend a little trim around the ears or yeah. something if you run for <laughs> office but but uh, but you, I think you got the mind for it. That was a very <laughs> successful evasion. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I want to open it up for questions. I want to ask just one more question. Um, when you first came to work here at a think tank, did you imagine doing this kind of thing? When you first came here, you were just kind of advocating for policies, right? Was there a moment when you said, hey, let's cut out the middleman rather than advocate <laughs> them? Let's just suggest that we do them. Uh, so the history of this project is I've actually been working on this since 2000, way before my time here, and had come out to Washington, D.C. to continue that work. The foundation headhunted me to come and work on policy, and now I've managed to like merge them together. So in fact, it's actually kind of a return to what I was doing back in the turn of the millennium in terms of developing open source mesh wireless technologies. Mm -hmm. and the stuff that we're developing, and the reason why we can jump right into this today is because we actually have a 10-year history of doing due diligence and programming and receiving private foundation support, National Science Foundation support into this project. And so what Ian gets to do is in some ways like come in right at the end and be like, okay, I want a cherry on top, let's make this go, <laughs> and he rests on top of a global development effort that has been ongoing for years. So. For me, it's more of like, hey, it's great that you know, all of this has fit together in this very complicated way to support policy reform and support on the ground in implementation and sort of to merge these seemingly disparate spaces in my life. Okay, good. Are there any questions? Um, am I supposed to choose? There's two in that row right there. That, that would be efficient. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm curious when you were talking about listening to other branches of government and accommodating them, 
and I'm thinking about the media companies and the Pro-IP Act and the Net Neutrality Act and the FBI and the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act and Child Pornography and National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And I'm wondering how this approach accommodates that. It seems that you've heard it, considered it, and said, I reject it and I'm doing it anyway. So I, I, I'm wondering how there has been an attempt to accommodate those interests. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there are a number of initiatives at the uh, State Department and across the government overall that are trying to bring all of these disparate interests together and come up with coherent policies around them. The Secretary uh, uh, a few weeks ago launched a cybersecurity strategy that, that ties many of those together. Uh, there have been similar strategies within other areas that have been launched uh, via other areas of the administration. Uh, within the past year, the State Department has uh, appointed a coordinator for cyber initiatives, Chris Painter, who's, who's playing that role of, uh, of trying to, to bring together these sorts of interests within the State Department and coordinate with other agencies that are doing that. So it is an ongoing discussion, and we, and we do have these, these talks, and, and we do uh, make other interests aware of the type of activities that we're doing. Uh, and, uh, and so those, those conversations, that, that, that happens, that certainly happens. I, I think it is an area that we, we continue to build and we continue to find appropriate ways to do that. More and more agencies and, and depart departments are getting their head around technology and as they do, they're being you know, brought into the fold as well. Um, but, uh, and, and the mechanisms continue to develop in order to accommodate that. So you mentioned that you would have your best open source people look and prove that there was no backdoor to this technology. But for those of us who know how to use a telephone but don't actually know how to build one or how it works, how are you going to prove to the people on the ground that this is something that is open and yet secure and that you haven't built a backdoor into it? And how are you going to help distinguish that from maybe a government that is going to go ahead and put together something that mimics your open source software? Yeah, those are hard, hard problems to solve. So our, our solutions are A, you know, make the code widely available. Anyone can go online right now and download the software code and start playing around with it and experimenting and looking at it and what have you. But we also have, you know, a series of experts, some pretty widely known in these spaces, and we do hope to work with, you know, groups like Electronic Frontier Foundation, let's say, or ACLU, and to say, like, you know, get your techies to look this over and let us know if you find anything. And it's it's an imperfect, like there's no perfect way to say like this is definitely open source. There's just a series of checks and balances that you can put into place. But our solution has been, I mean, we don't hide that, you know, we're receiving support from, you know, the United States State Department. And we're also very cognizant that that then leads to a lot of concern, which is traditionally, historically, rightfully placed. And so our solution is, well, let's be radically transparent and let's be radically transparent in the code and let's make it available. And if anyone does find anything, let's be radically transparent that that's been found and fixed. And so, you know, it, in many ways, it's like we're just working to build on the trust that we've developed for the past 10 years working on these projects before it was sexy. And with this national, this international coalition of different groups and to say, look, we want to ensure that we maintain that kind of history of supporting like sort of social economic justice as a part of this project, irregardless of who's funding it. Okay. Joel, you wanna you wanna finish it off? We've got one more minute, I'm told. Okay, so Al Qaeda gets a hold of this technology and there's an uprising in Saudi Arabia and the regime is overthrown. The Senate hearings are then conducted and you're in the hot seat in front of 800 television cameras and the question is, who lost Saudi Arabia? How do you respond? That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the aliens get a hold of it and then I'm called in to, uh, to, to, to justify on that as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, again... <laughs> well, what if the aliens did get a hold of it? <laughs> That's right. Then we would bring in Will Smith, and he would take care of it all. <laughs> That's the backup strategy. <laughs> Just very quickly, is there, can you imagine a scenario where this becomes important at the domestic level? You know, Jacob Weisberg said earlier, we all agree that there should be some control, child porn or something, and there, there you know, should be censored. There are, there are disagreements about what a government should do. 
Um, can you imagine a case where you would champion the use of this at the domestic level to circumvent the U.S. government? Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. So when, <laughs> when Ian used the term internet constrained environment, what immediately came to my mind when I was sitting up here was, oh, like the Indian reservations we work with in South Dakota. So like, I think there's a number of different places where you would want to deploy this, places that are underserved or unserved with any telecommunications infrastructure. But that's not to that circumvent that government control, that's to, to promulgate Correct. Well, access. Yeah, if you look yeah. at the history okay. of the development of this project, it came right. out of something called the Indian Media Movement where there were massive protests here in the United States and the government was beating the crap out of people here in the United States. And we were like, wow, we really need a mechanism whereby during these protests we can share information and make sure that even if people get arrested or their cell phones get confiscated or what have you, that information still gets out. Okay. So this is when I say like, this is applicable everywhere on Earth. It's not like just a technology for over there, it's a technology for everywhere on Earth. Okay, good. Am I supposed to yield the stage at this point, this being the end of the day? I, I want to thank both of you. I think even people, uh, e even people who, w who worry about what you're doing w would agree that it's very significant. Thank you. Um.